Welcome to the Atheist in Recovery podcast, where we talk about finding hope in recovery. And now your host, Dr. Adina Silvestri. Welcome to episode three of the Atheists in Recovery podcast. And today I want to introduce you to my friend, Dwayne Osterland. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist. He is a certified sex addiction therapist out of California. And I think you're going to enjoy the show. Uh, we, we talk about a variety of subjects in our short podcast together. Um, You know, and I think what's really, I want to really highlight for everyone is Dwayne's view on addiction. He is also a person in long-term recovery. And so he gets it. He gets the stigma associated with addiction. And he just, he wants everyone to know that, you know, no one chooses to become addicted to drugs or alcohol. It's it's not a choice. Um, and our society really still at large feels that it's a moral failing. And a lot of that is miseducation. Uh, and it's shocking that the medical profession is, is still – uh, contributing to the stigma that's placed on addiction. So we so we talk a little about that. We talk about the mind-body connection with addiction and how the environment very much affects who will be come uh, addicted to drugs and alcohol. And so I think that the only thing that we didn't really get to was the adverse childhood experiences study and um and I, I hope to address that in future episodes. Okay, so uh, let's get started. I hope you enjoy today's show. Dwayne, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. So I thought we would start with maybe a, a brief introduction from my audience as to, um, as to what you do, what you're known for. Sure, no problem. My name is Dwayne Osterland. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, uh, a certified sex addiction therapist. I'm also the host of the Addicted Mind podcast. And also, actually, recently, I just started another podcast as well called the Helping Couples Heal podcast um, with my colleague, Marnie Breaker. And that's about betrayal recovery. And um, so, yeah, that's about me. Wow. Okay. And I also read that you have 15 years experience in the addiction field. Yeah, I, I, working in mental health is actually a second career for me. Um, before I worked in mental health, I actually worked in the uh, entertainment industry. I worked in the photography part of it. I was a camera assistant and worked a long time in that field. And actually, I got into the mental health field a little bit by accident. I was working and um, was working on a set, I think, with some music video that uh, they were, you know, we were working on. And I tripped over some cable that was laid and I broke, I broke my leg. And um, so I couldn't work for a while, but I'm the kind of person that doesn't uh, sit still for very long. And um, I had already always been interested in psychology and stuff like that. And so I was on disability at the time. Um, and I said, you know, I could, it's summer. I could go take a summer class. I have about six weeks of disability before I can get back to work. And, um, at this point I wasn't really happy in that career. Actually, I was kind of like looking for something else. I said, I'll just go back and take a class and, and see what it's like. And I went and I, I met um, the, the the dean of the department. His name was Vince, and he kind of interviewed me. And he said, "You know, I have this class starting, you know, next week, and I'll let you in." And I'm like, "Well, let me think about it. It's six weeks long." I said, "All, all right, let me think about it. I'll, I'll do it." And I said, "You know, I'm not doing anything else. I can't work. I'll take the class." And 
I took the class and it was, it was a basic psychology class. It was uh, starting into um, the field of uh, licensed marriage and family therapy. And I really just fell in love with it. And then I spent the next two years kind of bouncing between two worlds, one on, on, in this old career and then starting this new career. And, and then there just came a point where I decided, you know what, I really love working in, in mental health. I really love doing therapy. I really love working with people. It's incredibly meaningful to me. And I just kind of went all the way into, into it. And that was about in around 2002, 2003. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. Wow. Yeah. So having that experience uh, in the class really opened up a new world for you, it sounds like. Yeah, it really did. I I just saw something that, you know, in a way, I think I'd always been looking for for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it really began to answer some questions for me. And I think a lot of people that move into and work in the mental health field do it because they're looking for their own answers, right? Mm-hmm. And I guess I was kind of looking to and uh, it helped me with that. And I, and I really, um, I just really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I often get that question. Well, how did you start in this field? And I say, well, you know, I love my family dearly, but they're probably one of the biggest reasons why I decided to go into psychology. <laughs> right. Our own history brings us in. And most people, most people get into the mental health field for that very reason. You know, we're, we're, we're looking to, answers, to answer our own questions. Exactly. Exactly. So because you've been in the field for so long, um, you know, the addiction field to me, it can be so rewarding, but it, but it also can be so heartbreaking. So tell me how you specifically got into the addiction counseling. Which sure. You do this work. Yeah, sure. Definitely. Um, I think that really goes back to my own personal history Um, I actually went into a rehab when I was 17 years old. I, um, I was a quite, uh, a depressed kid dealing with a lot of teenage angst and, um, found, uh, that specifically alcohol for me really helped with that angst. And I was dealing with a lot of depression at the time. And I think very lucky for me, I had concerned people around me that, mm-hmm. um, you know, especially my own family got me, got me to get help. And so I did do that. It was about a three week inpatient program and, uh, kind of got off the alcohol and, uh, it was extremely helpful for me. I mean, in some ways I think it really, uh, saved my life and changed the directory of my life because, uh, the direction of my life, because um, I think if I was if I had kept going that way, I don't know if my life would be what it is today. And I'm very thankful for that. That uh, you know, people did reach out to me at that time, at that age, and steered me in another direction. And um, that was, you know, ex- extremely. I was extremely lucky. I, I think about uh, kids today, and with the opioid epidemic, I know that when I was doing all of that, I would have taken any of those drugs in a second. And uh, because of where I was, I was a depressed teenager. I was in a lot of distress and I just needed relief. And um, in a way I'm like, thank goodness that wasn't around when I was young. Mm -hmm. Cause I think I would have done it, you Mm -hmm. know? And I think with my personality, uh, I don't think that would have been a good mix. So addiction has always kind of been a big part of my life. And then I did that for, you know, I, I got clean and, and then I, I um, went to university and, and uh, got my first degree, which was in film. And then I worked in the film industry for a long time and kind of left that part behind until I, as I was saying earlier, got into this second um, career. And this just kind of felt like a natural fit for me. I understood it. I had some experience with it and been there through it. And, um, I really just enjoyed helping people through that. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned when you were young, you had a lot of people reaching out to you. What were, what was the recovery, um, plan for you? What did that look like? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Definitely. I think, you know, um, God, that was quite a while ago. So that was really, 
you know, that was really at the, at the time that the 12 step model was the model for treatment. Right. And so it was very 12 step based. Um, and, uh, that's, that's what you did. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, you got up, you went to meetings, you met with people that wasn't completely yet. I mean, there was like some group therapy and some individual therapy and some, some skill building around emotion regulation and stuff like that. But, Mm -hmm. um, really it was, it was a 12 step approach to treatment. So, you know, going to AA and meeting with other people and other peers and, and, uh, doing all of that, that was the, the main thing, um, that I went through. Yeah. 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 12 step has been around for a long time. Um, and there's definitely some, some great aspects to the 12 step model. You know, I love, as I've said before, um, I've loved the community aspect of it. Um, it's, it's so important and so helpful. Um, right. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, uh, for me, when I was young, that, that helped me for a while. Um, that kind of kept me in a way I think about it now and I look back and I think, you know, I was pretty young and my brain was still developing and and changing and it kept me, um, I guess, you know, away from substances long enough for my brain to develop. And I thought that was a really good thing. I didn't stay in the 12 step. I didn't feel like I needed that or, um, or that really, uh, directly an addiction was an issue for me, uh, more I had struggled with depression. So, uh, once that resolved, the addiction issues for me kind of left and I never really felt like I needed to be in the 12 steps to, um, keep my life on a, on a, a path that felt good for me. Yeah. So you mentioned the depression a few times and once that subsided or lessened, the addiction went away. How were you able to yeah. identify what was going on with you at that time? What were well, some- that's, yeah, I think that comes with a lot of self-reflection. It was a long time ago and being able to kind of look back and see it from a different set of eyes. I was quite young back then, but when I look back at it, I, that's what it more, you know, feels like to me mm-hmm. and um, kind of what I was experiencing at the time and, you know, with perspective and time and, uh, maturity and growth and personal growth, you can kind of look back at those experiences and, and see them a little bit differently. Right. Right. And it sounds like you had a really good support network as well around you. Yeah. You know, I think I was, I was lucky, you know, a lot of people don't, don't have that, but I did have a really good support network around me. A lot of caring people that helped me through that very difficult time. And, um, I really appreciate you know, those individuals that were there for me at that time because they did help me through a very dark uh, phase of my life. And, you know, a lot of kids go through that. I mean, if you look at like the rates of suicide for young people, it's astronomical because, you know, you're at that time and you, you know, you're, you're, you're impulsive and your, your brain is, um, you know, still developing and, and you're having all these difficult feelings and, all of that stuff and you don't know how to handle them. And, and if you don't get those skills early on, uh, you can be a lot of distress. So I feel, I feel that I was, I was very blessed in that way. So I want to take a minute and just talk about, talk about self medicating with alcohol and drugs. Um, I feel like that's a pretty common thing, um, for the individuals I see. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how you approach addiction and and what are some ways that you help individuals in that way, if they're dealing with difficult emotions, because, you know, AA, although I think it's a great tool, um, doesn't, doesn't really talk about the emotional aspect of healing. And I think one of the phrases that I hear from my clients is, you know, you can act yourself into the right emotions. Maybe talking a little bit about that. Sure. Definitely. I mean, I think addiction, that's a primary cause of addiction, right? We feel something we don't like. We we're experiencing something in our bodies that is unpleasant, either, uh, you know, an unpleasant 
affective state or emotions, and we don't know how to we don't know how to change them or shift them or move them. And we can use substances to do that, or or behaviors to do that. We can use um, you know alcohol or heroin or sex or food or uh, intense behaviors like gambling or high risk sports to change how we feel, right? I think addiction comes in is when these things become harmful to us in a way that they're, yes, they're changing how we're feeling, but they're not life enhancing anymore, you know, and they have these negative consequences and we continue to do that in spite of those negative consequences. So a lot of times for people that are coming in and working with me, uh, the way I see it is like, we have to work on that emotional component to, to be able to regulate. Otherwise you're just left in distress Mm -hmm. and that's no fun. And after a while you can't tolerate that distress for so long that you're going to go back and you're going to find something to change it. Right. And so that's where, to me, that's where the recovery work comes in, right? You've got, you know, the emotion regulation, that helps you deal with these uncomfortable mood states and feelings. And then you have the nurturing component of recovery, which is building the life that you want so that you have less of these negative emotions because you're, you're living in a state that is congruent with you, that feels good for you, that um, is connected to your spirit, uh, your, yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah, all too often individuals will come in here with an addiction into my practice and, you know, they, they want to stop the addiction, obviously, but it's always a surprise to them when we start to talk about the trauma. Um, and that could be a big trauma, that could be a little trauma, it could be anything in between, but it's something that they, they've never really thought about maybe um, or right. didn't really know to address. Yeah, definitely. A trauma is a big part of it. If you've if you've grown up and you've had childhood trauma, you're going to have dysregulated emotions. You're not going to know how to deal with that, and that's going to create more pain. And once again, an addiction helps you with that. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, for someone who is struggling with an with an addiction, it's it's a multitude of things that have to happen to facilitate that change process, right? So we got to have the emotion regulation, but then you also have to create the social construct around that. That's where groups like 12 step, I think are really, really helpful uh, because you have a peer support group of people who understand what you're going through. But for some people, 12 step uh, doesn't totally feel right because it has, you know, it's based on a religious principles. So there's other options like smart recovery or uh, life ring or um, refuge recovery is another one. So I think that's, that's a, that's an incredible in. I also think that's a very important part of, of recovery is that social aspect too. And um, to get that social support that you need. Mm-hmm. And so what do you recommend to the clients that come and see you? Is there, do you recommend all of the above? Is there one that you prefer to, to the others? Well, I I think once again, when someone comes in to get help uh, with me specifically to work with me, I really try and meet them where they're at. You know, uh, what resources do you have in front of you right now? that you can use um, and really actually helping them connect to their internal resources that are present in them. And that may mean going to a support group. Sometimes people just feel so much shame about their addiction that, or the behaviors that they've done in their addiction that uh, they're not, you know, it's hard for them to reach out to others. So, helping them feel safe, encouraging to do that, encouraging them to do that, but at their own time and pace and what feels right for them. You know, um, I really think it's important, you know, each person is unique. 
So it's important to be able to meet them there at that place and be that support for them Mm -hmm. and teach them about addiction, how it works in the brain, how it functions in their body uh, so that they can kind of understand what's going on for them, give them that knowledge uh, that, you know, for sometimes once they kind of understand, oh, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Sometimes that just brings relief in and of itself to be able to say, oh, oh yeah, that makes sense. I, I can see that. And then that also gives them hope for change. I'm like, well, look, if you do these things, you know, this shows, you know, we, we through what we know so far about the brain and, and different uh, modalities of treatment. If you do this, this might help you here. If you start practicing mindfulness, it might help you be able to regulate some of these difficult feelings you're having. If you start working in dialectical behavior therapy and understand how your emotions work, that's going to help you. And so, you know, meeting where they're at, where they're at giving them the skills that they need, um, and then kind of going from there. Can you talk a little bit about what dialectical behavior therapy is? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, I really like dialectical behavior therapy. That's um, That was, des- I guess, uh, created by Marsha Linehan. She was kind of the founder of it. And it's, it's in a way, it's a mindfulness-based uh, therapy around emotion regulation and helping people understand the dialectics in their life. And a dialectic is two competing needs and you can't, you, you can't meet both at the same time. They're opposed to each other. So you have to be able to navigate that. And recovery is full of that, right? If I, if I go over to this side of the dialectic, I'm going to feel uh, sad and depressed. But if I move over to this side of the dialectic, I'm going to feel anxious well, you can use a bunch of skills to navigate that dialectic and be able to make decisions that are more in your, in DBT, they call it the wise mind, you know, more of a centered place. And then you can make strategic decisions, not necessarily based around just how you're feeling in the moment, but you can make decisions that uh, further your long-term goals for yourself. Mm -hmm. And you design your life Um, you decide how your life is going to be, and then you get the emotion regulation skills to slowly build it. That sounds like that could be a very powerful therapy for individuals in addiction. I, I, I really like it because a lot of times, once again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, addiction is about avoiding and escaping the very difficult feelings that we don't know what to do with. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you learn the skills to be able to cope with those difficult feelings, you can make choices that are going to be better for you. You know, and I mean, I've used it in my life. It's helped me tremendously to be able to regulate my feelings, decide what I want to do, because that fits into my long term goal of what my want my life to be. And, uh, doesn't work all the time, but it doesn't have to work all the time, right? Mm-hmm. It just has to be good enough, right? And most of us, you know, sometimes our emotions are going to get the better of us and, and we're going to make decisions that are always the best for us. But if we do it most of the time good enough, that's great. We're going to be pretty happy people and uh, pretty satisfied. Mm-hmm. So, you know, also, you know, moving people into that and being able to, to, to work from there as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for for explaining that to us. Right. So I like that you talk a lot about um, the education component with addiction and helping people understand what addiction is. I feel like the medical community at large um, doesn't do a very good job of that. And there's just this dis- this disconnect between mind and body. Mm. And so, and so that leads to, you know, the labeling and the shame and the policymakers not, you know, giving enough money to prevention and recovery. And so uh, I, I think that's so in, incredibly true. And, you know, I, I think finally in the last, you know, 
couple decades here, addiction is starting to be understood as a, a brain disease. But if you think about it, you know, AA came around in the 1930s. That's not that long ago, okay. you know, and uh, it, w- it came about because the the medical community basically said it's a moral issue. We don't know how to treat it. We don't know what to do. And, you know, so people who are struggling decided to help themselves and figure out what worked. And that's how partially how AA was, um, was kind of born through that, that need. And so it was a lot of times separated from the medical community. And I think, you know, it's good that it's coming back to that so we can understand um, it from a medical perspective and treat it that way and start to, yeah, lessen the shame around addiction. I mean, it's a huge issue and, um, you know, and also change our, our social policies around addiction. I think we just, uh, we, we keep addiction going by the way we handle it. You know, people need help. No one wants, to, <laughs> no one wants to be an addict. It's, it's not a fun place to be. No one chooses that. Um, most people want recovery, but they need the support and they need a lot of support and it's worth it. Yes. You know, it's worth doing it. And um, I think that's part of the reason why I, I, I do the Addicted Mind podcast is, is I want to get that information out there to people so that they, you know, they can look at all their different options out there for treatment because what works for one person might not necessarily work for another person. So I always say, keep going, don't give up, find something else. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I'm, I'm definitely a fan of the Addicted Mind podcast. So oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. So we are just about wrapping up and I thought we could um, end with a, a little bit of a bizarre question that I've been asking a lot of individuals lately. <laughs> All right. Um, I like bizarre questions. Go ahead. Great. Okay. So if you had a time machine and you could travel into the future, mm-hmm. what would you see? What would recovery look like in the near future? Oh, God, if I had a time machine. Well, I think, um, let me think about that. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, it would be much more preventative in the sense that, you know, we would teach young people, kids even, about how their brains and bodies work Mm -hmm. and how best to manage themselves internally as well. And I think if we can do that, we could help a lot of people avoid getting into addiction in the first place. And then if people do get into addiction or, or that becomes an issue for them, that it's treated with compassion and they are surrounded by loving support, you know, so that they can then thrive in the life that they deserve. Right. Like any other disorder. (laughs) That's right. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and then we look at it to that and that we in the shame around um, addiction and, uh, um, we help people who are struggling. Yeah, it's great. Just as I was helped. If you could write a phrase on a billboard for all to see, what would it say? Oh gosh, that's a hard one. Um, <laughs> I didn't even have any time to think about that. What one phrase on a billboard? Um, uh, what would I say? Enrich each other. Enrich each other. Yeah. Enrich each other. Mm. And that's what we need to do. I love that. Okay, Dwayne, where are the best places that people can reach you? Awesome. They can find me at the and they can subscribe to the podcast there. They can also go to our other podcast, helpingcoupleshealcom as well. And uh, they can also find me at uh, novismindfullife.com. 
And yeah, love to hear from everybody. Great. Yes, I will provide links to all of those, um, all of those in the in the show notes. Um, okay. Well, thanks so much for being on. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Atheists in Recovery podcast. For more great info and to stay up to date, head over to atheistsinrecovery.com.